Amen. Giving all praises to our Heavenly Father. Amen. Thank God for our, our choir back there. I'm waiting on some more singing. They say it's time to preach. Amen. We certainly thank God for them. Great job this morning. Um, thank God for all of you that are here in person. Amen. As we worship our Lord and Savior. Amen. There's a word that I wrestle with three or four days here. We're going to try to share this. I started to just preach something else that I had all together. But uh, for some reason, um, God uh, wouldn't let me do that. And so we're going to try to share this with you and hope that it bless you uh, today and that you'll have a better understanding uh, when we've done about this passage and what it means to have a right relationship with, with God. We're going to talk about, and if nobody ever shared with you, there are four aspects of righteousness that we're going to share. Hope that you'll understand them here in this text. Amen. Those that have your Bibles, um, a lot of verses here, but um, just for time's sake, um, can I just read verse 1? Because this is where my subject is going to come from. I want to read verse 1. I want you to get verse 1, verse 4. And I want you to look at the B part of verse 16. Those are going to be the highlight of chapter 7 that we are sharing with you. Not like the NIV, but this time I, 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 I looked at uh, the New King James Version. And uh, I said I want to read um, from the New King James Version. And I'll tell you when we start looking at the text, the difference difference and uh, Genesis chapter 7 um, verses uh, 1 uh, verses 4 and verse uh, 16 especially the B part of 16 now, if you want me to, I'll just read on down to verse 7, but uh, those are going to be the key verses. And you'll find these words. It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me, in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, male and his female. Also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species of life on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, this is one of my key verse, after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did accordingly to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his son's wife, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Skip down to verse 16, be our last verse. Verse 16, it says this, and pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them to Noah, came to Noah and entered the ark 
Wrong verse. I read 15. Thank you. Uh, here it is, verse 16. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God has commanded. This is the part I'm trying to get to. Then the Lord shut him in. Don't miss that. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Um, we want to use for a subject, if it's okay, this morning, it's time to get on board. It's time to get on board. It, it's, it's time. Can, can we say it together? It's time to get on board. Amen. It's time. Yes, it's time. And if you want to, you can let's you can look at your neighbor. And says neighbor, it may be time for you to get on board. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for this word and giving us clarity of thought and and Lord how we pray that you would bless me to convey with clarity and understanding your your word and we pray oh God that you would help me to reveal to them that they'll see what you've shown me in this text forgive me of all of my sins all of my shortcomings in the name of Jesus you said in your word that if a man say that he has no sin that man is a liar and the truth is not in him but if we're willing to confess our sins you are faithful and just to forgive us and to restore us in Jesus name is our prayer amen amen giving respect to our co-pastor to all of our ministers to our deacons to all of you that make up this uh, worship setting amen those that are watching from home as well uh, it's time to get on board this is what verse 1 began with let me just do a little introduction here uh, through the book of Genesis um, we've done a series of sermons uh, from the book of Genesis a while back as we preached a while back uh, talking about making progress without God you can make progress without God but we shared with you progress without God is just an illusion amen and we see that in the book of Genesis that they progress but it was just an illusion but progress with God is true progress and progress with God requires believing God's promises now um, here what happened in chapter 6 is um, the Bible says in verse 2 in chapter 6 that the sons of God saw um, that the daughters of uh, man or humans um, were beautiful and they designed to have them and the Bible says that they took them and whomever they chose and they married them and so what happened here and uh, what's going on here uh, when we look at chapter 6 um, and they began to multiply and whenever a believer marries help me here Holy Spirit an uh, unbeliever um, chances are your offsprings um, will become unbelievers and so when the believers intermingled with uh, the unbelievers um, and it's, it's true today the unbelieving spice, spouse will always pull down the believing spice. And so this is what happened. So the whole world 
uh, just like um, turn it back on God. And at this time, God was, God was sorrowful that he had made man. Um, there was no one that even called on the name of the Lord anymore but Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so God revealed to Noah that he was going to destroy um, all living creatures upon the earth. And that he wanted Noah to build this ark. And um, so this is chapter 6. And at the end of chapter 6, we see that the ark of the Lord is completed. Amen. It's completed. And after the completion, we see Noah yet waits on further directions. Uh, he does not take it upon himself to enter the ark. And so here in chapter 7, we see where the Lord commands and he invites Noah to come into the ark. Uh, you and all your household. I, I really looked at this passage be, uh, because some translation says uh, that the Lord um, uh, said to Noah, go into the ark. And the difference is, and this is why I read uh, the New King James, and James Version because what, uh, based on the word study that I saw, God was already in the ark and he's invited Noah to come in to him. You, you know, since, since God is omnipresent, he's everywhere at the same time. And notice the text, he invites Noah to come in and after Noah went in the Bible says the Lord shut the door and so what God is conveying to us he was in the ark waiting on Noah to come in and then after Noah came in God closed the door God never left where he was to close the door because he's everywhere at the same time <sighs> And so in chapter 7, there's a, there's a great gap of time. The Bible just skips between chapter 6 and chapter 7. And from, from biblical study, we know that it skipped 120 years. Uh, so Genesis 6 ends with God telling Noah to build the ark. And Genesis 7 is where we began. begins with God telling Noah to enter the ark. Are y'all going to pray with me? Amen. So, so we know that Noah took him 120 years to follow the instructions to build this ark. And, and Noah had been preaching uh, the coming judgment of God while building this monstrous bark like structure. Now, we, we don't see that in Genesis where he preached. You, you got to go over to uh, Peter. And uh, Peter is the one who revealed to us that uh, Second Peter, if you want to check it out, Second Peter 3 and 10, said that while Noah was building the ark, he preached, he preached to those of his constituents. He preached that judgment was coming and uh, God was going to judge the world. He was going to destroy all mankind with the exception of Noah and his family. Amen. And so here we see now that, that Noah finished the ark. Amen. And, and, and he, he was no doubt while he was building his ark, he was being taunted, he was being laughed at. People had never seen any rain. And here Noah building this big old Ark, this big old ship in the middle of nowhere, uh, they, they was just thinking he lost his mind. But he kept working on this ark. He kept building 
this ark and he kept preaching the word uh, to them that God was going to judge the world and that man could repent and they could turn back to God and God would have mercy upon them. And so here, help me here, Holy Spirit, the account of Noah finding favor with God is a beautiful foreshadowing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel says that man is as sinful as he ever was. And there is none righteous. Amen. There is none righteous. Although God destroyed the world. Don't you miss this? Man is still as sinful as he was. How do we know that? Romans 3 and 10 says, no, there's none righteous. Not even one. For all have sinned and all have come short of the glory of God. And this same gospel says that one day God is going to destroy all flesh again. He destroyed all flesh with the exception of Noah and his family once. And the Bible teaches us that it's going to, he's, going to do, he's going to do it again. But not, not water next time, but fire next time. He's going to burn this earth. And I know just like some didn't believe it the first time, some don't believe it now. It may be time to get on board. Maybe time to get on board. God, God, God has provided us a way of escape. He has provided, just like he provided during that time, a way of escape, the ark. It was big enough that anybody who really wanted to be saved could have been saved. And, and God has provided uh, for us in our day and time a way of escape through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is our ark. He's our ark of safety. Just like this one big ark of safety that Noah built, this ark, this boat, it only had one door in the side. Jesus Christ, when he hung there and they pierced him in the side, it was out of the side. Blood and water began to gush out. It's that blood that washes away our sins. He's our ark. He's our strong tower. Let me move on. Just, just three things we're going to try to pull out of the text, if you will. Pray for me. Uh, first thing uh, that we see in this text, God's divine preparation. Amen. It was God. Uh, divine preparation. God designed. Amen. This ark told him how to build it, how big to build it, how wide to build it, how many stories to put in it. Amen. We see the providence of God. The ark built by a human agent under inspired uh, directions. The word of God. Preparation. And God made this divine preparation in the face and in spite of uh, an opposing world. The world didn't want this ship. The world thought it was a waste of time. But yet we see God's divine preparation. It has been said, help me here, that the greatest temptation in this world is for a person to walk through this life doing what he wants to do and what pleases him. That, that's the greatest temptation of life. It is to just do what you want to do and thereby to ignore God, to neglect God and reject God. 
And this is what they was doing in Noah's day. The result is always death. Look at James 1 and 15. It says that temptation leads men to dark places. Disappointments. Destruction. And eventually death. By definition, preparation is something done to get ready for an event or undertaking. So God was making preparation to get ready for this event where he was going to judge the world. This preparation meant safety and peace to to those who would trust in it. And God himself pronounced the terrible destruction of the judgment. He was going to destroy every living creature that he had made. And in the Hebrew translation, it says that God literally said that he was going to wipe out or blot out every living creature from the face of the earth. We marvel at the unbelief of people in Noah's day. But they're no different from the people of our day. Look at the unbelief of our world. Few believe, most disbelieve. In fact, many people even deny that the great flood ever took place. Many persons do not believe that God will ever destroy the earth. But they're wrong. He did it before. He's going to do it again. Because the Bible declares that that not one jot, that one till of my word will fail. Amen. God did it. And the great tragedy is this. God is going to be forced to destroy the earth again. Because people are still rejecting God. Their creator, even cursing and denying him. And so, uh, this morning, um, it's time to get on board. We see in the text that all of those people that was lost, they had an opportunity to climb aboard. Amen. Maybe, maybe that's why God is, 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 is it, it burdened me the other night, wouldn't let me rest. I, I, had, I was just about to change my mind. And, 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 and maybe God wants me to just, uh, just, just, just stab at somebody. Uh, one of the definitions, let me tell you why I said that. One of the definitions of preaching, if you look it up, it means to take the word of God, which is the sword of God, and to stab at one's heart. That's what preaching is. It's to stab at people's heart. God wants your heart. God wants you to hear him. God, God wants to kill you. You got to be killed in order to make a life. They had an opportunity to climb aboard the ark and be saved. Right now, I hear, I hear Jesus because he's a great uh, preparer. He says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Amen. He, he's, he's a great God of preparation. I hear, I hear him tell Abraham when he told Abraham to take his only son Isaac to a mountain and uh, offer him. And, and, and Abraham was getting ready to offer his son. And I hear the Lord said to Abraham, study your hand, Abraham. Uh, God has prepared for himself a ram in the bush. He's a great preparer. Amen. When I look at 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, uh, Paul says, but it is written, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has did it again, prepared for them that love him. I'm talking about God's divine preparation. I'm going to move on. Y'all got me. So, so we see God's divine preparation. God has prepared this ark of safety. And here we are right here. And so the next thing that I want you to see is God's divine faithfulness. 
Oh, sweethearts, God is faithful. He's faithful. Amen. He says to Noah, come into the ark. And all thy household, come. Don't you hear Jesus says, come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. The Hebrew word here, come, is a very tender word. It's like a mother or a father when a little child is outside playing and a storm is coming. And the wind's picked up and the children are unaware of what's going on. And they call to their children and says, children, come in the house. Come in the house. Come on in the house. Because the parent sees the storm approaching. And this is what God is saying to Noah. Come. Because judgment is near. Come. 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 And what he's saying, Noah, it's time to get on board. It's time to get on board. Ah, he was within the ark as well on the outside of the ark. I, I, anybody glad that you serve a God that can be everywhere at the same time? A amen. He's omnipresent. He was with him. In the ark, as well as outside the ark. He would be with Noah. And this is God, what God says, come. So God says, come, come, come to me. Because I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you. Nor will I forsake you. Come. And he would look after Noah. Within the ark as well as without the ark. And so God invited Noah to enter. Notice what else verse 1 says. Help me here, Holy Spirit. It says, God invited Noah to enter the ark because Noah was righteous before God. Now, I want to help you understand what that means. Noah believed God. When God told Noah it was going to, he was going to destroy her. No, no, I believe God. And uh, Noah believed, and, and, and not only did he believe, but Noah obeyed God. And in the book of Genesis here, uh, I, 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 I preached this before with just a real recap. Uh, you know, Abel, Abel worshiped God. Got to put it together. A Abel worshiped God. Enoch walked with God. But Noah worked for God. I, I do it again. Let y'all get it. Abel can't kill it because he worshiped God. Enoch walked with God. But Noah worked for God. I heard Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day for night coming, no man can work. It's amazing that some believers don't feel like that they have to do anything. I just come by to tell you that there's a work for all of us to do. There's a work for all of us to do. And so we see in this text God's divine preparation. And then we see God's divine faithfulness. He didn't forget about Noah. He invites Noah in. And he says that he invited him in because Noah was righteous. Now I want you to understand what, what, what the Bible means says when Noah was righteous. Noah was righteous in this respect. And for those who don't know, if you want to write them down, and if you want to pull them up on your phone, there's four different aspects of righteousness according to Scripture. Okay? I'm going to give them to you. One is that God is absolutely righteous. 
He's righteous, and we see Psalms uh, 97, 2 declares that God dwelled in righteousness and justice. That's, 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 that's him. In other words, the righteousness of God is unchanging and unchangeable because God is righteous in his nature. He has a righteous nature. See, see the Bible says, don't, don't miss this, it just says that God invited Noah in because he was righteous. You, you got to know what kind of righteous he had because in chapter 9, we see Noah, he gets drunk with wine. And for some reason, I got all his clothes off. And, and so Noah is righteous. So what is God saying? God is saying that he sees Noah because Noah has a righteous standing with God. See, see, see when God sees us, he sees us because we have a righteous standing because we believe him, but, but we still have an unrighteous state. That's why our co-pastor have been talking about elevate. You got to work on that state. You, you have a righteous standing, but you need to work on your sanctification. Let, let me help somebody. So we see, number one, we have the righteousness of God. God is absolutely right. When God sees us, he don't see us like he sees himself. Because we don't have a righteous nature. And then there's another righteous. It is called the self-righteousness of man. In other words, we see that in Isaiah 6, 4, and 6. In other words, man righteousness in the sight of God is as filthy rags. See, a lot of us, you can think you're righteous. I don't do that, honey. I never done that. That's self righteousness. See, the Bible says all have seen, all have come short. So when you start talking about what you have never done, that just filled the rags before God. It's like going to the dirty clothes laundry, pulling out your dirty underwear, presenting them to God. That's your self-righteousness. So we see the righteousness of God. We see the self-righteousness of man. And then we see the imputed righteousness of God. What is imputed righteousness? This is what Abraham, this is what made him righteous. This is what made Noah righteous. When God revealed to Noah his word and what he was going to do, Noah believed that. And so imputed righteousness, in other words, the Bible says, and you read Romans chapter 4, that Abraham was declared righteous. He was righteous because he believed God. And notice something else. Because Jesus had not come and died yet, the Bible says it was a credit to him. In other words, God gave Abraham his righteousness on credit. God gave Noah his righteousness on credit because Jesus had not yet come and died, the righteous one. See, there's one no one righteous but God. So when Jesus came, and this is what, let me tell you, this is what, this is what, this is the way God said. This is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is when you robed in the righteousness of another. I'm going to give you a good example. You'll read right over in the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve had sinned, and they tried to make themselves sufficient garments, and God, and God, they was hiding from God. And, 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 and so what happened was God came down and said, Adam, where are thou? And God saw they had tried to sow some leaves together and they were still showing everything. <laughs> this is what God done. God took an innocent lamb. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. This innocent lamb. He took an innocent lamb which represented his son, the lamb of God. He killed him. The lamb hadn't done nothing. He killed him. It was a type of Christ. He skinned him. He dried the skin. And the Bible took the skin of the lamb and he robed them. And that's what, that's what imputed righteousness is, is when you robed in the righteousness of another. So when God sees us, he sees us with the right garments on. He sees us with the right garments. And when God saw Noah, he saw Noah had on this right garment. He believed God. He, in other words, see, to become righteous, you have to be justified. You have to be justified. And he was justified by faith. 
By faith, Noah believed God. See, justification has to do with being forgiven. Once you've been justified, see, justification covers all your past sins. It covers your present sins and whatever your future sins. This is once, once you are saved, you can never lose your salvation because God has justified the believer. And so Paul talks in Romans 8, Paul says, what can separate us from the love of God? And the answer is nothing. Now, so we have the righteousness of God, we have the self-righteousness of man, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Okay, and the last one is the imparted righteousness of the Spirit. See, when you believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believe him shall not perish but have everlasting life, several things happen. The Holy Spirit takes you and seals you. We're going to see that in text. I hadn't forgot it. I'm going to get there. He sealed you to the day of redemption. It's right here in the text. You'll read over it. He seals you. He put a seal up on you that the devil and nobody else can remove. He sealed those that are his. And then the next thing happened that when you're truly saved is the Holy Spirit comes in. And he lives in you. So this is the important righteousness. So when the Holy Spirit comes in to take up residency in your life, and when you yield to him, he will produce fruit in your life. This is why in Galatians it talks about love, peace, joy, and all these things. And it says the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You, that's not you producing that, honey. That is this important righteousness. And so Abraham, along with Noah this morning in this passage, and it's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let me move on. So we see here in this text, we see God's divine preparation, and I'm just about done. I got to cut it short. I'm losing some of y'all. That's all right, but y'all heard some of this stuff I wanted to share with you. Listen. So we see God's divine preparation, and God has prepared a way out for us. How did he do that? St. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That word only begotten means that God has but one biological son. All the rest of us, honey, you've been adopted into the family. Don't look over there thinking you're better than sister so and so. All y'all been adopted. But let me tell you something about adoption. Once you have been adopted into the family of God, it's irrevocable. You cannot never not become his son. You always be a son. It's irrevocable. Yes. One more thing I want to share with you. I'm done. So we see God's divine faithfulness. Amen. He invites him in. Noah comes in. And guess what? Don't miss this. Uh, if I were you, I wouldn't wait till the last minute. Some of y'all think, I got time. But check this out. See, see, this is what theology is. Theology means study of God. The word the means God. Ology means study of. This is why we keep searching the scriptures, keep reading it. Because every time we go over, we see something that we didn't get before. And so here, when we look at this passage, uh, God says uh, to, 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 to Nor. It's time to get on board. Well, no rain, no wet. Don't, don't miss this. Verse 4. Look at that. It says, seven days from now. In other words, God invited him to come on. And God said, come on, get on board right now. 
Although the rain is not going to start to seven more days. See, Noah, Noah believed God. And, and Noah, you know, in order to believe God, you don't have to understand all the details. But look at the heart of God. For, for some reason, God had him to come on board. And they stayed on that ark for seven days waiting. Seven days, seven days. It could be that if you plan on waiting on the last minute, guess what else? Don't you miss in verse 16. And the Bible says, the Lord shut the door. The Lord shut the door. And so we see God's divine sufficiency. Literally, and the Lord shut the door. What it literally means is that God covered around about him. The shutting him in insinuated, don't miss this, that Noah had become the special object of divine care. When you in Christ, you are the object of special divine care. If you're in Christ, that's why Ephesians says in Christ, in Christ. All through the book of Ephesians, you see the word in Christ. That's our position, in Christ. And what Paul is trying to help us to understand that once you, uh, you, 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 you know, once God shuts you in, once God seals you, uh, that Noah became the special object of divine care and protection. God will keep you. The Lord himself shut the door. Listen, the idea is that God sealed the door to protect Noah from a leaking boat. What good is it to put you on board an ark and it has a leak in it? Oh, I wouldn't serve a God who didn't know how to seal me up. The ark, I'm just about done. The ark was a type of a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the believer's refuge from judgment. God is going to judge the world. You know, you, people, people are saying, God ain't going to do nothing. Some people believe that. See, see, God has a fixed time to judge the world. He has a fixed time to judge us. Now, we know that if death come knocking on our door, the Bible says it is appointed to every man to die once, then come to judgment. See, your judgment come quicker when you die. That's why I just come by to tell you today, it may be time to get on board. Because you don't know where death is. Because after death come the judgment. You don't get a second chance. Ephesians, in him, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation to whom also having believed, you were sealed. This is what God done to, uh, to Noah. He sealed this ark. He protected him. Protected him. Listen, sealed him. Every belief is sealed. The, it, it's, it's clear that the ark symbolizes what Christ does for us. And listen, listen, this is our guarantee. See, sealing represent that God has guaranteed eternal life. He's guaranteed. He's guaranteed. And what God done for Noah, it was guaranteed. Noah, you're going to be the one to make it when all this water dry up. You and your son. You have the guarantee. The Lord shut him in and guess what he stayed there until the water went down and then the Lord was all he was in there with him but you gotta miss this and then the Lord let him out the Lord let him out he stayed there till the Lord let him out Lord have mercy Lord have mercy No wonder Jews says now unto him who is able divine sufficiency 
who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault in that great day with joy to the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. I'm talking about God's divine sufficiency. Guess what Jesus says? Matthew 24, and I'm done. This is what Jesus said when he was on earth. He went to this same story that I just preached to y'all about. Can you hope, can you just give me another minute? Don't, don't tune me out. Jesus pulled this up. In Matthew 24, this is what it said. But of the day and hour, no one knows. Talking about when the Son of Man is coming. Not even the angels in heaven. But my fathers only. But as the days of Noah were. There it is. As the days of Noah were. Before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away. And so also will the coming, here it is, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It could be. It's time. Get on board. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Come on, HL. I'm done. Could, could be. I, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad one day I got on board. I, I got on board that old ship of Zion that has landed many of thousands. Maybe that it's time for you to get on board. And maybe you have a right standing before God, but maybe it's time to get on board to work on your state.